This is what's left of the market in Kurakovye, a town near the front line in eastern Ukraine. Shelling killed 10 people here this week, and it's not the worst of it, as the Russians intensify their attacks all across the Donbass region. Bakhmut has seen the worst of the onslaught. There is fighting in the streets. The city is in flames with constant explosions, but the city is still under the full control of the Ukrainian armed forces. The Ukrainians say taking Bakhmut would give Russia no real strategic advantage, but Moscow needs symbolic victories after months of setbacks, and Kyiv is feeling the pressure. The frontline situation remains very difficult in the key areas of the Donbass, Bakhmut, Solidar, Marinka and Kremina. For a long time there has been no place left in these areas that has not been damaged by the shells and fire. The occupiers have actually destroyed Bakhmut, another Donbass city that the Russian army turned into burnt ruins. From the dire gloom in Kyiv to the glaring opulence of the Kremlin, Vladimir Putin toasting Russian officers with sparkling wine. <laughs> Appearing in a good mood, he boasted of his bombing campaign on Ukraine's energy infrastructure, arguing that it was a retaliation against Kyiv's aggression. He also compared himself to Peter the Great, not something new for a man drunk on imperial history, but Moscow may now feel it can sustain the war in the months ahead. The United States says Moscow is now relying on Iran for supplies, such as lethal drones used on Kyiv back in October and used again today in Odessa. But is Putin's seeming confidence just bluff or a warning? Putin, of course, cuts a confident figure by choice. Uh, that's the image he wants to convey of being in control and command, being a strong leader and so forth. Uh, the reality is that uh, they are really getting hit by sanctions and their military is performing very badly. They've lost a lot of lives, they've lost a lot of equipment, and that's why he's having to go to countries like Iran or North Korea for help. And on the other side, as Ukraine asks for more military support, there's still a dividing line within NATO between a more cautious Central Europe, afraid of provoking Russia, and the more aggressive Eastern nations. It comes as the head of NATO says he's worried about the war spinning out of control. It strikes me as part of a series of statements over the past two weeks. Um, we saw Biden say that ultimately he's willing to talk to Putin if Putin's ready to end the war. We saw Macron talking about security guarantees for Russia. It sounds like there is discussion going on in the NATO corridors that uh, we do need to have a diplomatic track. That being said, what I would say is that we're not ready for a diplomatic track yet. The, the Russians are still intent on fighting and killing Ukrainians. In Norway today, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to three thorns in the side of the Kremlin, human rights activists in Belarus, Ukraine and Russia itself. A reminder that campaigns are long and drawn out, and that even these awards are symbols for hope, rather than a guarantee of peace ahead. Here in Moodley there. Well, I'm joined now by Ukrainian MP Maria Mezentseva. Um, Maria. President Zelensky has said today that Bakhmut, you saw in the report there, is now basically burnt ruins. But why is Russia targeting that particular place? You know, we can't uh, explain this war rather than really, like, weird explanation that we've been receiving from uh, February 24th as the aggression, as an act of aggression, as this crime of all, the mother crime, as it's been called by international lawyers, had to be justified somehow. But how can you justify something that you already ruined at some parts? And this is mainly civilian infrastructure. It's the buildings of the people who can't live there any mm -hmm. longer, hospitals, kindergartens, etc., as in many other areas. So basically 99% of those targets are civilian infrastructure. Why would they be shelling that again? Well, we are witnessing all the strategies that they are failing. During the energy crisis, which is overlapping across Europe, uh, it, probably Putin was expecting people to come out to the streets. They didn't. Bakhmut remains the beating heart of this war, as was Mariupol, for instance, which is temporarily occupied. We hope to liberate it. I've been seeing videos and footages right from there, just before the interview, and it does look devastating. However, this position in war comes into centimeters. Mm. So they, the position are very closely located, still we are in under, under control of Ukraine. Well, they're fighting over metres, aren't they, mere metres? And this comes a month after the liberation of Kherson. Does it seem to you, does it feel like we've reached something of a stalemate? And is that a concern 
for the winter ahead for Ukrainians, how are you going to get through it? Definitely not. You know, some are expecting uh, more uh, severe winter um, uh, circumstances to go further for the liberation strategies. And as a war volunteer from 2014, being uh, in direct contact with different battalions, I can tell you that the, uh, this men and women are so highly motivated. It's been all the time we are being asked, are you, are you courageous enough to go on? Yes, we are. But also, Maria, a lot of people are without power. President Putin has admitted now targeting civilian infrastructure. You will say that's a war crime. Uh, absolutely. It's, it's, you know, it looks to us as an energy genocide. Well, genocidal nature is there. So these are war crimes, crimes against humanity. But let's not forget it all happened for a second time since 2014 by committing a crime of aggression. And that's what we've discussed just earlier yesterday in the Middle Temple, joined by uh, General Attorney and MPs and others. We have to address this crime by setting up a special, special tribunal for the top military and political leadership of but Russia. Where does this war go in the next year? Because President Macron, Chancellor Schultz, they've talked about dialogue. We've seen a prisoner exchange between Russia and the US recently. Do you sense pressure from your partners for Ukraine to negotiate? I can tell you we're touring for already 20 days almost. We are finishing our tour here in London uh, on Monday. And I've, we've been with a delegation in Berlin, in Paris. We're not sensing that there is a pressure for a dialogue uh, because we are receiving clear positive signals from our partners that they are ready to imply justice as of setting up a special tribunal go further with a ninth package of sanctions. We've been witnessing great move on sanctions imposed by the UK government yesterday. We're conducting talks with the US partners. So as much as we are trying to enlarge and sustain this um, support to Ukraine in military sense, humanitarian sense, sanction sense, there are crises rolling. We understand that we don't, we can't afford the fatigue. That's why I can reconfirm the support is still there. Maria Mezenseva, thank you so much for coming to speak thank to us. Thank you so much. Thank you.